I open these talks with the myth of the Roman goddess Cura, an intriguing and mysterious character whose name, which literally means care in Latin, is, an etymolog is the etymological root of the words insecurity and security. According to that ancient story, Cura stops by a river to mold a human figure from clay. In a spontaneous and generous act of creativity, she conjures our species into being, calling on Earth, Saturn, and Jupiter to provide crucial assistance. Cura gives us the gift of life, which is, at the same time, the gift of finitude and fragility. As long as we breathe, there is the inescapable fact of our mortality, our existential insecurity. Cura fates us to need care and to care in turn. To be vulnerable and dependent on others is not a burden to escape, but the essence of human existence, as well as the basis of the aforementioned ethic of insecurity, a potentially powerful source of connection, solidarity, and social transformation. We are, as the philosopher Cornel West once told me, beings toward death, featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces whose body will one day be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Cura's gift invites us to face and embrace this rather than flee from it unnerved. When we accept our vulnerability, we can begin to rethink conventional ideas about what security is and how we might attain it. Instead of retreating to the security of the burrow or the bunker, fortifying ourselves and our possessions, we can forge a different path, recognizing that real security comes from taking care of one another. And yet, accepting Cura's gift is not easy to do. This is especially true when insecurity envelops us, a feeling captured poignantly in the second coming, the poem echoed in the subtitle of these lectures. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. The Irish poet William Butler Yeats composed these memorable lines in 1919, a period of heightened tension and upheaval, both political and personal. The aftershocks of the Russian Revolution, the recent strife of the First World War, and the Spanish flu pandemic that had left the writer's pregnant wife close to death. Traumatized and spiraling, Yeats hammered the events overwhelming him into potent verse that has provided a century of companionship to readers who feel marooned by chaos. A composition for people beset by forces they neither comprehend nor control, but fear and grieve. It is a poem steeped in the insecurity Sorry, it is a poem steeped in the terror that insecurity can bring, and one that yearns for an impossible solidity, for a center fixed and stable. Yeats longed for order and permanence, for the falcon to once again hear the falconer's command. In my own way, I wrote these lectures in what felt like a vortex. Amid the myriad social and political crises that I talk about, as well as further troubles that hid closer to home. Not long after I started writing, my husband received an unexpected diagnosis. A visit to the doctor revealed he had cancer. While drafting the first lecture, I had briefly mentioned cancer as a common source of insecurity, an example of the ways our lives can be suddenly derailed. I had imagined it as the kind of misfortune that strikes other people, not something in my family's imminent future. We waited for test results and surgery while I wrote lecture three. As I sat at the keyboard to formulate intellectual arguments about insecurity as a, a systemic phenomenon, worst case scenarios played out in my mind, my anxiety manifesting as room spinning vertigo. We were fortunate to have health insurance and the ability to pay the bills it didn't cover. 
And like many of the people I organize with, we didn't have to go into debt to receive life-saving treatment, which spared us the added strain of financial hardship. Friends offered support, helping me think through material that, once clear, was now swirling. Thanks to good luck and the prompt and capable care of doctors and nurses, my husband was cured. The episode resolved nearly as quickly as it started, leaving us stunned and grateful. My equilibrium returned, now tinged with a deeper appreciation of life's tenuousness and unpredictability, and a renewed commitment to transforming how our society relates to vulnerability. None of us are strangers to insecurity, whether it's the kind of panic inspired by my husband's illness, the pang of self-doubt felt at school or on the job, or apprehension about the state of the world. But insecurity, as we have seen, is more than just a subjective state of mind. It also describes objective material circumstances, lack of access to health care, unstable income or employment, precarious housing, extreme weather patterns, and more. Insecurity thus spans the psychological and physical, emotional and economic, and in doing so reminds us that, this, that these seemingly distinct registers are, in fact, entwined and inseparable, an, entang an entanglement Yeats' poem movingly conveys. Insecurity is not only in our heads, even if it is a core aspect of the human condition. It can also be imposed upon us in ways that amplify rather than tend to our fragility. It is, to borrow a phrase from feminism, personal as well as political. Throughout these lectures, I've tried to show how our economic system depends on manufacturing and security to create more pliable workers and insatiable consumers. Economists have long commented on capitalism's tendency towards crisis and instability, a feature Karl Marx and Frederick Engels identified in the 19th century. Market society, they wrote, is defined by the constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation. Capitalism generates change and rupture. It's a system in which, as Marx and Engels put it, all fixed, fast-frozen relations are swept away. All new-formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. For centuries now, insecurity has kept us scrambling, serving as an engine of striving, buying, and endless expansion, a motor propelling us toward the cliff of ecological calamity. But amid this incessant turbulence, some things remain remarkably consistent. It is inevitably the most vulnerable who bear the brunt of volatility. The privileged find ways to shield themselves from risk, turning periodic shocks to their advantage, while claiming that material insecurity is required to keep everyone else toiling and productive. And yet, they've rigged a game that can't be won, one that keeps even them stressed and miserable. The privileged, too, have much to gain from adopting an ethic of insecurity, one that instead of fueling inequality and feeding feelings of inadequacy, asserts a universal right to human security. That's a right guaranteed to us by international and domestic law, but one that too often languishes unheeded on the page. This right has been undermined, in part, by our culture's denial of Kira's gift. Instead of understanding the desire to give and receive care as an essential human motivation, we rely on coercion and punishment to keep society moving. Instead of creating systems that prioritize care, we stigmatize it, while also undervaluing the labor caretaking entails. Just compare the income of a hedge fund manager or tech executive to a teacher, custodian, or home health worker. We valorize production, the paid work performed in offices or factories, for example, while ignoring social reproduction, think child rearing and homemaking, tasks which, which fall disproportionately, though not exclusively, on women. Capitalism tells us that security flows from physical health and financial success, from able-bodiedness and wealth, and we consider people who possess these traits to be secure and self-sufficient. In contrast, those who obviously rely on others, and especially on assistance from the state, are denigrated as weak, dependent, and deficient. This is a lesson I first learned from disability movements. We all need care, 
throughout our lives, from birth to death, not only when we are struck by illness. What the writer Rebecca Solnit has called capitalism's ideology of isolation encourages us to ignore all of the ways we are, in fact, mutually dependent. 